Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Saturday class. I hope you enjoyed the class with Professor Kiva. Uh, today in my class we are talking about travel. This is a pretty fun topic because most of us have traveled before. We're hoping to travel again soon, but coronavirus is keeping us from doing so. But we're going to talk about where we've traveled, where we'd like to travel, some of the problems we've faced with uh, speaking English when we internationally travel because English is the you know, international language for communication. So we're going to be looking at that. So first I'd like to just start with the PowerPoint. Let's go to that. Hi, hi everyone in the group, in the chat, live chat. Okay, so I want to look at this quote first, which says, traveling, it leaves you speechless then turns you into a storyteller. So of course this means that when you travel to amazing places, you're speechless, you can't believe how amazing the place is. And then you turn into a storyteller. So you don't talk at first, and then you talk a lot about your experience. So before we start anything, I want you to tell me in the live chat, what is something you have seen when you were traveling, even if it's traveling in Korea, traveling in Korea is okay, or traveling to another country that made you speechless? What was something that was amazing that made you just, you didn't even know what to say? It was so beautiful or so awe-inspiring. For me, it was when I traveled to uh, very, very far western China into Tibet, and I saw the Himalayan mountains. I was in the Himalayan mountains and waking up and seeing the Himalayan mountains all around me was just unbelievable. So what is something that you have seen when you were traveling that just made you speechless? Write it in the live chat if you have any thoughts. And while you're doing that, we're going to look at a few other questions. So if you can't think of anything that's left you speechless, if you just don't have any ideas about something that just made you feel so amazed at earth and at life, just tell me simply, where have you traveled in the past? Have you traveled for business or only for pleasure? Pleasure means just for your own trip. And where would you like to travel next and why? So write that in the live chat if you have a moment. Where have you traveled? Have you traveled for business or only for pleasure? Where would you like to travel next and why? I'll wait a few minutes in the live chat. in the live chat. People are typing, I think. Okay, Unju Shin says, I couldn't see it because I was sleeping in the car, but my family saw a zebra, or it might have been a horse, on a road in Jeju. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, wait. A zebra in Jeju? How? How do you see a zebra on the road in Jeju? I think it must have been a horse. How could you see a zebra? Now, I have heard stories. I will say this. I've heard similar stories to this happening in the U.S., where people say that they're driving in the countryside, and out in the field they see, like, a herd of zebras. But when they tell their family the next day, their family doesn't believe them. Like, how, how did you see zebras, a wild zebras, in America? That doesn't happen. So maybe this person's story is true because some zoos, some zoos will borrow fields from farmers to let the zebras wild for a day. Like horses, they let them go and eat the grass in the field for a day. They move the zebras from the zoo and let them eat wild grass for a day or two. So this does happen. And if you see it, it can look very crazy. So maybe your family did see a zebra, but I don't know. Are there are there any zoos with zebras in Jeju? I don't know. Okay, Chung Daun says, when I traveled to Quebec, I was just amazed at the pure beauty of nature. Yeah. I've never been to Quebec, I've never been to Canada, but yeah, some places just the nature is just amazing. Okay, um, yeah, where would you like to travel next? 
Where where would you like to go? That's that's the last question I'm curious because we've all been sitting in our houses so much because of coronavirus. We'd all love to go travel. For me, I'd like to travel back to I'd like to travel to a lot of places, but I need to travel to the UK to see my family. Because I mean they haven't even met my son yet. So I need to I need to go there so my mom can see my kids. Um, Jenny says, I would like to travel to the U.S. Good. Yep. U.S. has lots of places you can go. Most people go to like New York City or California. So I'm not sure where you'd like to go. In says Cuba. Oh, Cuba would be really fun. I'd like to go to, or some people say Cuba. Going to Cuba would be fun. I'd like to have a Cuban sandwich. Oh, that'd be nice. Yeah, lots of places I'd like to travel. I'd like to go back to Guam. I'd like to go to just anywhere. Just Tired of being in my house all the time. I think a lot of people can relate. A lot of people can understand that feeling. Okay, you can keep talking in the live chat about that. That's great. But I'm also going to go and talk about a few rules about traveling to keep in mind when speaking English. Uh, so, let's look at a few rules. The first is when you're traveling internationally and you're speaking in English, Use gestures when speaking. Now, some gestures can mean different things in different countries. I know that there can be gestures like in Korea that are normal but are rude in the UK or in other places. I understand that. But when you're talking, it's good to use gestures for numbers or for pointing to where you need to go. Because some people may have a harder time understanding your accent. So it's a good idea to use hand gestures while speaking. This also encourages the listener to look at you while you are speaking, which means that they will pay more attention to what you are saying. So if you're asking for a table of five, you can hold up, you know, like five fingers. Of course, I have said that there are gestures that are not good in different places. Like even in Korea, we do this for cameras a lot, right? We smile for the camera. But this in the UK is very bad. You, you don't, if you want to say two in the UK, you need to have forward facing hand, not back. It's very bad in the UK. So little things like that that we don't even think about can confuse people. But generally, it's a good idea to use gestures so people understand you more easily and pay attention to you when you're talking. Just a good idea. Uh, let's see. Let me look at the live chat. Uh, Jung Daun says, I would like to take my kids to Korea and travel everywhere. Yeah, I'd like, oh, I want to go to, I want to go to Jeju. I want to take my kids around to the beach and just different like pensions. That'd be nice. Jenny also says that Cuba would be nice. Uh, Sun Hyun Ju says, wherever good weather is not too hot or not too cold. Yeah, just, we're all desperate to just travel anywhere <laughs> at this point. Uh, yeah, coronavirus has kept us inside for so long. Okay, be patient but persistent. Persistent means don't give up, but be patient. So, rudeness will not help you in situations at an airport restaurant, hotel, or conference center. Always be polite, but don't be a pushover. Be persistent with the person, but never get angry. And if this doesn't work, we'll go to the next slide in a minute. Um, so yeah, when you're traveling, remember to be patient and be kind. Don't be rude. Rude doesn't, rudeness doesn't help you. Um, I'll give you an example. I was a long time ago, when I was in university, I was flying home from Europe, and the book was over. the The plane was overbooked. There were too many tickets and not enough seats. I was already like on the plane at this point, but or I was getting on the plane. I had my seat number, but a couple came to the desk and were complaining that hey, we have tickets. Why can't we get on? They were yelling and screaming. And they were so angry that they couldn't get on the plane. And so I came up to the front desk and I said, I'll give up my seat. And I'll get one of my friends to give up a seat if we get, you know, if you give us some money. The airport, if it, not the people, the airline gives us money. Because that's what they do if you give up your seat. So they said, yeah. So I got money. I, got, I think it was like $500 to give up my seat. I actually got on a plane, a different plane, 10 minutes later and got home faster than the first plane. So I got home faster and I had $500. It was great. So if you're polite and you're paying attention, not being rude, 
you can, you know, get some nice things. Uh, has anyone else had an experience where you were polite and something good happened? Uh, let's see. Also, in this slide, you can see it says, don't be a pushover. Don't be a pushover. What, what is a pushover? Does anyone know what a pushover is? This is a good word to know. Don't be a pushover. If you can tell me what a pushover is, I will confirm if you're right or wrong. It's good to be persistent. Don't be rude, but also don't be a pushover. Let's see if we get any answers in the live chat from that. The next rule is have a plan B. Your original plans may not work. The hotel might be full. The weather might not cooperate with your outdoors event. So it is always important to have a plan B. Learn about the area you are visiting. Have an extra USB with the PowerPoint you might need for your presentation if it's a business trip. Hope for the best. Plan for the worst. So my example is, oh no, it's raining. Our whole day is ruined. Don't worry. I read about this other place we can go to. Yes, Unju Shin over in the live chat says, a pushover is a person who can be easily controlled by others. That's correct. You're easily pushed. People can easily push you, not physically, but easily push you in a different direction. Yeah, kind of mind pressure, In says. Yeah, kind of people are easily able to uh, peer pressure. I don't think mind pressure. Peer pressure you. They can make you do things easily. Don't be a, don't be a pushover. Don't give up easily. But also don't be rude. Okay, so we're talking about having a plan B. I want you to talk in the chat room. What is a time that you traveled and your plans were ruined? Just it didn't work the way it was supposed to. I will give my best example. I went to Guam three years ago, I think. Three or four years ago. Three years ago. Went to Guam. for. We were there for five days. Every single day, all day, 24 hours, it rained. It rained the whole time we were there. I think the last day it stopped raining for 30 minutes. We ran to the beach. We were on the beach for like 20 minutes and it started raining again. So we got to enjoy the beach for like 20 minutes. It was a disaster. <laughs> we just did a lot of shopping. We stayed in our hotel room a lot. We ate at our hotel. We had to walk everywhere with an umbrella. It was just... I want to go back to Guam when it's not raining. That would be nice. What um, What is the time that you went on a trip that your plans were kind of ruined? Let me know in the comments. And yeah, I'm not, I, I wish I was exaggerating. I really wish I was exaggerating. It rained all day, every day. It was unbelievable. Yeah, it might be a rain tour. In says, yeah, it was, we, I got to see a lot of Guam in the rain. Okay, let me know about your disastrous trips in the live chat. I'll check them out in a minute, but I'm going to keep going. Uh, number four, when speaking English, when you're traveling abroad and you need to speak English, be careful with yes or no questions. You know, you need to ask for comprehension. Many people will answer yes, even if they didn't understand you. So they don't want to, you know, they don't want to be rude. They don't want to say, what did you say? I don't understand you because of your accent. They don't want to be rude. So they try to understand you if you're asking a yes or no question, but maybe they don't. And they say yes or no. Maybe they say yes, even when it's supposed to be no. It, they're just not, they can't understand you. Um, it's better to ask information questions, questions like why, what, were, when. My example is, when will the conference begin? That's much better than, does the conference begin at 7? Also, 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 remember with English, negative questions work differently from negative questions in Korean. So in Korean, if you say like, uh, you haven't, you haven't eaten yet, the correct answer would be yes, I haven't eaten or no, I have eaten. 
but it's opposite in English. If I say, you haven't eaten yes yet, I would say, yes, I have eaten. No, I haven't eaten. Negative questions in English receive the same answer as positive questions, yes and no. So remember that when you're asking yes or no questions in English, because that can be pretty confusing. Uh, Jenny in the live chat says, once I lost my luggage at the airport and I couldn't find them until the end. It was a two-week trip and I lost my all of my personal belongings. But you found them in the end. But wow, that's annoying. Yeah, I've I've had that happen to me. That's not even the worst thing that's happened. Yeah, I've had them lose my luggage for a whole month. I was traveling to visit my mom in the UK. They lost my suit, one of my suitcases for a whole month. And they just wouldn't help me. They they were so, I will never fly that airline again. I'm not going to say which airline, but I will never, ever fly them again because they were so unhelpful, which is the worst. Yeah, losing your, Jenny, I feel your pain because when they lose your luggage and they don't help you figure it out, it's really, really annoying. I understand that. Okay, here's a tip I have for you. Assume everyone understands Korean. It's dangerous to say bad or good things about others in Korean, assuming that they won't understand you. Be careful what you say about people in public. They might understand you. And of course, I have quite a few stories about this. Um, I, this has happened to me in my early days in Korea. It hasn't happened in a long time. But my first few years in Korea, this would happen. People would talk about me, good things and bad things in Korean. I would understand them. I would tell them, hey, I understand you. They would be embarrassed. But this has also happened. This happened on my trip to Guam, that trip to Guam. Um, I was in, we had to do laundry there because we were there for five days. So we did some laundry. I went to the laundry room and Guam was, there were tons of Korean tourists. So there were lots of Koreans there. Um, and I was in the laundry room. I found a wallet. I found somebody's wallet. And it was, I looked inside, it was a Korean ID. So I'm like, okay, so some, somebody lost their wallet. Then a Korean couple comes in to the laundry room, and they're using one of the machines I need to use. So I'm waiting behind them. And they're saying in Korean, who is this weird foreigner? Why is he watching us? Why is he, like, waiting for us? What, who is this creepy guy? And I understood them. I didn't say anything, but I understood them. And finally they turned around and I said, do you know whose wallet this is? And it was one of their friends, so they were apologetic. But... Um, yeah, <laughs> don't assume people understand you because I know a lot of people don't speak Korean, but some people do. And if you say something bad about people in Korean and they understand you, it's going to be very, very embarrassing. So just assume that people understand you. I have to do that in Korea because I speak English and I speak English to my wife sometimes and we... I have to be careful not to say things that people might understand because so most people here understand English. So, yeah, just, just be careful. Um, okay, let's see in the live chat. People are saying, oh, it's awful. Oh, it's so rude. Oh, no. Oh, my, my, my. Yes, it was um, embarrassing for them. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Okay, so those are my, my tips for traveling. Some of my tips. Uh, so I want you to tell me in the live chat one of your personal experiences uh, when you were traveling. Maybe it's a problem you had. Maybe it was a miscommunication. Maybe a difficulty you experienced while traveling. Like how uh, Jenny mentioned that she lost her luggage. Things like that. Tell me a problem that you had when you were traveling. What do you think? Jenny says I should have talked back in Korean. I didn't want to call. I didn't want to make it worse. Well, I what I did do is I asked them, you know, is do you know whose wallet this is in Korean? So they they knew that I understood Korean. <laughs> that was the beautiful part. I didn't I didn't mention that when when they finally looked at me and I could show them the wallet. I asked them in Korean, like I found this wallet. Do you know whose it is? And then they were yeah, kind of ashamed because <laughs> they figured out that I knew I understood them. They don't expect the white guy in Guam to understand Korean.
tell me one of your stories, your travel experiences where something went wrong, a disaster, a problem, a miscommunication, something difficult. In says, I couldn't understand numbers in Spanish, so I used a calculator to understand how much a sandwich is. Okay, so you just showed them the number on the calculator, maybe? Yeah, I've had people do that in Korea to me when they think I don't speak Korean. Uh, Chung Dawan says, I don't think I had any problems. Can't think of any. Lucky me. Uh, speaking of in story, um, couldn't understand numbers in Spanish. Several, this was quite a few years ago. I was shopping like at an outdoor market somewhere in, I don't know where it was, somewhere in Gyeonggi-do. And there was someone selling like earmuffs to keep your ears warm. This was winter. And I wanted to buy, they were cute, so I wanted to buy them for my wife. And I asked him in Korean, how much is this? You know, very easy to say in Korean. How, how much is this? I asked him, you know, hold this up. How much is this? <laughs> the shopkeeper, who was very old, she did this, she went, I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. So I said, I asked again, I'm like, uh, how much is this? And again, she said, and I said, man, ochon won you? And she said, yes, yes, man, ochon won. It's man, one, two, three, four, five, ochon won. Because <laughs> she thought I didn't understand Korean, even though I asked her in Korean. So, um, yeah, I've had experiences where people think you can't count. Um, Let's see, Jenny says, agreed, it's very hard to order food or drinks in different language countries like China, Japan, or Spain. For me, I have so many stories because I've traveled a lot. Um, when I first went to China, I was like, I was 20 years old. I was young Josh. I went to China by myself. I lived there for 10 months. I spoke no Chinese. I couldn't use chopsticks, and I definitely could not read Chinese. I was not in Beijing or Shanghai. I was not in a big city. I was in Chengdu, Sichuan, which at the time, no foreigners. I could walk around all day in the city and not see another foreigner. So things were not in English. There were no signs in English, no menus in English. They did not have forks for tourists. You had to use chopsticks, even if you couldn't. And me trying to order food at a restaurant with menus in Chinese, no pictures, it was just... Every day I would go to the restaurant, point to a different thing, order it, and see if it was good. The next day I'd point to a different thing on the menu and try it until I learned what the menu was. <laughs> um, yeah, Jenny says, why did I go there? My, my bachelor's degree is in cross-cultural cross communication. That's my major for my bachelor's. My, my master's is education, but my bachelor's is cross-cultural communication, so it was about Things like ethnographic studies, studying different cultures, um, learning about their language. So I had to live in different places. I traveled to Africa for a while and studied culture. I lived in China for a while and studied culture. So that was for my university. That's why I did it. So my junior year, my third year in university, I lived in China as part of my studies. And still had to do classes online and things. Um, Let's see. Uh, In says, oh, I had the same experience. I misordered food, so I had to eat three main dishes <laughs> or only two desserts. Wow, yeah, just experimenting. <laughs> it's a lot of food. Um, let's see. Minju Shin says, once I don't remember where I went, but we were driving and we jostled a motorbike and we didn't have enough space to stop, so we tried to move a little forward and stop. But the owner thought we, I don't know what the rest of this is. I'm waiting for her to type. Um, so you went somewhere and you jo like you bumped a motorcycle i guess you bumped a motorbike you tried to move forward but the owner thought we were running away so we couldn't understand each other so just miscommunication they thought you were maybe bumping their motorcycle on purpose and running away or i don't know yeah that's that's kind of scary when you're not trying to do something wrong but you accidentally do something wrong that can be a problem 
Um, okay. Let's see. Keep t- If you have more stories, type them in the live chat. I like to hear these kinds of stories. I'll read them and talk about them. But I'm going to keep going with the PowerPoint. We have like 30 minutes left. I don't want to waste any time. So I want to talk about a few phrases we can use while traveling. A few different, I think there's like 10 phrases here. 10 categories. So here's some phrases for airport vocabulary. I hope you know all of these. I hope you're probably going to know most of these vocabulary words and phrases I introduce. But if you learn even one or two new words or phrases, that's nice. So for airport vocabulary, checked baggage. This is the luggage, the suitcase that you check on, that they put, you know, underneath the airplane that you can't grab. You have to wait when you arrive at your destination to pick it up. Carry-on baggage is what, well, you carry it on. You carry it on with you like a small suitcase or backpack. Check-in counter is where you check in, where you get your ticket. The gate is where you wait for your airplane. And the boarding pass is the ticket that you need. And of course, uh, baggage and luggage and suitcases, all the same thing. There's no difference, especially luggage and baggage. Same word, synonyms. Just remember that luggage and baggage are uncountable, but suitcases are countable. So you can say, I have lots of suitcases or I have lots of baggage. I have lots of luggage. You cannot say luggages or baggages. They're not countable. Um, Okay, so that's some airport vocabulary. I hope you know all of those already. This one says your checked baggage exceeds the weight limit. I'm remembering so many stories from my past. When I was leaving China, when I was coming back to the U.S. after my 10 months in China, I I had been studying the language, so I spoke a little bit. I wasn't that great. I couldn't read or write. I didn't really try to learn to read or write because that's so difficult with Chinese. I just focused on like speaking and listening skills. And I could do, I, I've lost everything now, but that was so long ago. But I could understand some. So when I went to the airport and my suitcase was too heavy and they were telling me in Chinese, again, this was not a popular airport. There were no tourists there. They didn't speak English at the airport. They're telling me in Chinese, your, your suitcase is too heavy. You need to take some stuff off. I just kept saying, what? What are you talking about? I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. And they got so frustrated with me. They just said, just, okay, just, just go, just go. So <laughs> I acted like I didn't understand them and I didn't have to pay extra money for my suitcase. They just let me go because they were so annoyed with me. That was, that's another one of my stories. Uh, okay. Uh, Sianju says, I think sometimes problems may happen with the person you travel together with, so you should take care of each other. Yeah, definitely. If you're traveling with another person, take care of them. Make sure that you both are keeping safe. You know where each other are. It's easy to get lost in a new place. Okay, let's look at airports. Here is a phrase you can use at airports. Where is my gate? Very simple phrase. Yeah, gate is the place where you board the plane. Use this phrase when you're at the airport and need to find your departure gate. And sometimes the gates change. I've had that happen before. I've been waiting for a gate and they changed it. So I had to like move to another another gate. It was kind of surprising. I almost missed my plane because of it. Um, Yeah, where is my gate? Another at the airport. I'm traveling for business or I'm traveling for leisure. When you're going through uh, customs, when you're going through like, when you have to show your passport and you have to show your plane ticket and your visa, if you have a visa, they might ask you, are you here for business? Are you here for pleasure, for leisure or pleasure? You have to tell them, you know, I'm just traveling for business or I'm just here for vacation. Um, They want to know what you're doing in their country. So yeah, just... If you travel to another country, they're going to ask you why they're there, why you're there. And, yeah, waiting in line at customs is, oh, I hate that part of traveling. You've gotten out, you've traveled on the plane for like 12 hours. Now you have to wait in line to show your passport. You're so tired. You just want to get your suitcase and go. 
I don't I don't like that part. Uh, let's see. Jenny says, yes, some airlines are very strict with weight limits. This was a long time ago, so I don't think they were as strict. Uh, Unjushin says, there were many times when the gates changed, so it's always confusing. Yeah, I've had that happen before. It can be, you have to pay attention. At airports, you can also say, I will be staying for mm, days, because they want to know how long you're visiting their country. So in the U.S., the customs agent might, or the border agent might say, how long will you be visiting the U.S.? Well, I'll be staying there for five days, you know? How long will you be staying here? I'm not sure. I'll be staying a couple of weeks. My visa, I have a three-month visa. I don't know. And remember when some places you travel like Guam, when I traveled to Guam, that's the U.S. It's, it's not a U.S. state, but it is the U.S. So, like, me traveling to Guam, I don't need a visa because it's my country. Um, even though I've never been there and it's not a state, it's kind of weird but yeah so just you need when you travel you need to know do you need a visa what travel do you need right now the u.s if you're traveling to the u.s soon they just changed a lot of their rules this week about for coronavirus you have to have a coronavirus test within the past three days or you need to have like verification that you are vaccinated that kind of thing you're getting very serious about it which is good Okay, in the live chat, uh, let's see. Jenny says, I think nowadays we also need to carry COVID vaccination certificate too. Yeah, I don't I don't know of different countries. I, I'm actually curious about that. Like, what do I need to show when I travel back to the U.S.? Because the only vaccination card I have is my on my phone. If you've been vaccinated in Korea, you know what I'm talking about. There's like the, what's the name of the app? I think the app is C-O-O-P or something, something like that, that it shows your vaccination, but a lot of it's in Korean. So I'm not sure how I can show that to U.S. and they believe me that I'm vaccinated because they won't, they can't read Korean. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I'm going to do when I need, to, oh, Jenny says it's C-O-O-V-A. Thank you. Yeah, that app. It shows your verification here. I'm not sure what, I don't, I don't know if they're going to believe me. So I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm vaccinated, but. I don't know. I don't have any, like, paper or anything really in English that shows it. Okay, at airports. Also, where is the currency exchange? If you need to exchange money into the local currency, you need to visit a currency exchange. They are often inside the airport. Um, Jenny says, oh, C-O-O-V. Ah, I knew it. I thought it ended, like, in V or B or D or something. Thank you. I'll give you a tip. I was watching a YouTube video just this week about people traveling to Prague. So if you travel to Prague or if you travel to like Europe, if you need to exchange money, if you want cash, do not talk to people outside on the street. People outside on the street will say, hey, hey, I can give you a better exchange for the money. I have a better exchange rate. Don't do it. Go inside of a bank and do it. Because these people, you'll give them like 100 euro or 200 euro to exchange into prog money, but they won't give you prog money. They'll give you something that looks like prog money, but is worthless. It's worth nothing. So you're giving them 200 euros and they're giving you trash. It's It was amazing watching this video. Like, be careful. Be, be, be careful about that. Um, the ATMs are also sometimes tricky. If you, if you go to countries, and this is all over Europe. If you go to countries in Europe, and you want cash, and you put your, your card, your Korean debit card, into the ATM, and you want to, you know, convert some money, it will ask you, it will say, accept or decline. Do you want to accept and convert, the cur convert into our currency, or decline and not convert into our currency? You need to push decline. You will still get the money. You'll still get the euros or whatever money you need. But when you convert, when you're saying accept, you're telling the ATM to convert it with its conversion rate. Not a good conversion rate. When you push decline, you're saying, I will let my bank, my bank back in Korea that I trust decide the currency exchange rate. So like if you push accept for these ATMs, 
you could lose like 10 or 12 percent of your money with an exchange rate. It's very, very tricky. Very like tricky little ATMs that you're going to lose money. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend researching more about that if you're going to travel to Europe and you want to use your card for cash. Um, yeah, definitely research that so you don't lose money. It was kind of eye-opening for me because I, yeah, I didn't know about that. Um, okay, let's keep going. Hotel vocabulary. <clears throat> concierge, front desk. The front desk and the concierge, same thing. It's the same thing. The concierge is just a fancy word for front desk. It means the, the people you talk to if you need help or to get your room or key or turn in your key. Room service is when you order food and they deliver it to your room. Turn down. What is turn down? I'm curious if anyone in the chat knows. What is the turn down? And wake up call. Not, we don't do wake up calls as often anymore, but in the past you could ask the concierge to give you a wake up call. And they would call you on the phone at like 6.30 or 7 or whatever time you tell them. And they will wake you up. It's a wake up call. But what is turn down service? If you can tell me in the live chat, I'll be very happy. <clears throat> I even have the, uh, the sample sentence, the example sentence. I need to call down the concierge, down to the concierge about turning down my room. What does that mean, turning down your room? Turn down service. They touch your room one more time. What do you mean touch? That's what Zhang Daoan in the live chat says, but I'm not sure what you mean by touch. Change the room? It's not changing rooms exactly. You guys are on the right track. You have the right idea. Uh, okay, a lot of guesses. Turn down is just where they... When you come into the hotel room, for the first time, the bed is made. It's brand new blankets and sheets and pillows, new towels and things like that. Yeah, Soyak says basically cleaning. It's kind of cleaning, but turn down is more less about cleaning and more about new towels and new blanket or make the bed. Make every... All of the cloth should be fresh like new towels and maybe even new shampoos and soaps new blankets new pillows whatever like that make the bed give us new towels that kind of thing so if you no it's not rejecting room cleaning it's accepting room cleaning you need the room cleaning because if you're if you're at the hotel for a long time you might not want them to clean your room every day because you might be in the room and you just don't want them to come in because then you have to leave and then a day or two later, you're like, wow, we don't have any more towels. What are we going to do? You have to call down for, uh, for them to yeah, turn down your room so they can give you new towels. Okay, at hotels, how do I access the internet? Most hotels offer free internet, but you may need to ask for help signing in. Of course, this is a... Why do they call it turn down, Jenny asks. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know why they call it turning down. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. A lot of things in English, it, I'm sure it made sense at one time, but I don't know the original reason. In says to refresh a room. Well, that's much better. That makes more sense. Please come and refresh my room, please. That makes more sense than turn down. Um, okay, also, where is the front desk? The front desk at a hotel is also called the concierge. It is where you check in, check out, and where you can ask questions. Um, yeah, so the front desk or the concierge, if you want to be fancy. Let's look at some restaurant vocabulary. The bill is what you have to pay. Appetizers are to whet your appetite. I'll, I'll write that in the live chat because you might not know that. So appetizers, the goal of appetizers is are made to wet your appetite. And when I say wet, W 
H E T. I'm not. That's not a misspelling. It's it's a word you've probably never heard. It's not a very common word, but it means to increase your appetite. So when you eat a little bit of food, like an appetizer, it makes you hungry to eat more. So wetting your appetite means to like start or increase your appetite. Um, so yeah, that's an appetizer for your appetite. Uh, okay. The tip, oh, we're going to talk about the tip. Service charge, we're going to talk about that. And the server. We used to call servers waiters and waitresses. It's not as common anymore because we're trying to, English is gravitating more towards gender neutral terms. We don't like waiter and waitress. We like server. We don't like stewardess and steward. We like flight attendant. It's better because it's for both men and women. Uh, Jung Dalin 76 says, so the phrase turn down came from that. Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Jung Dalin 76. They actually turn the very top part of your bed linens down a little for you to get in easily. So the phrase turn down came from that. Thank you, Jung Dalin 76. I learned something today. Okay, so they turn the very top part of your bed linens down. Oh, like, oh, so when they make your bed, like the very, where the pillows are, they kind of turn it down a little bit so it's easier to get into bed. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, I've never, never heard of that. That makes sense though. Thank you for explaining that. Yay. Yes, Ginny is giving little clap emojis. Um, okay, so tips. We're going to talk about tips. So when you go to restaurants in especially the United States, you have to tip. And it's annoying. And there's service charges too. Sometimes there's a service charge. Um, which is just extra money that you have to pay for no reason, it seems. If, if you go to a restaurant with, it's usually six or eight people or more. So if your party, if your group is eight people or more, they will give you a service charge. And the service charge is basically automatic tip. They automatically make you pay tip for eight people. You don't get to choose. You have to do it. For fewer than eight people, um, there's usually not a service charge, but you still need to tip voluntarily. How much should you tip? What, what do you think? What is, what percentage of money should you tip at a restaurant in the U.S.? In says 20% and Jushin says 10%. Um, I heard 10%, 10, 10, 10. 10 is very low. Um, it's typically 15 to 20%. That's the accepted, 15 to 20%. If your service was okay, 15%. If your service was great, 20%. If your service was bad, still you need to tip like 5 or 10%. Um, yeah, 30% is pretty high. That'd be very... Very nice. People would really appreciate that. Yeah. Chung Down says 10 to 20. Mm, 15 to 20 is better. 10 is pretty low. 10 is you're not happy with the service. Yeah, 15 to 20%. Um, I think tipping is archaic. It's old-fashioned. We shouldn't have it anymore. But a lot of restaurants in the U.S. don't pay minimum wage to their workers. So the servers, instead of giving getting like $10 an hour... They only get like two or three dollars an hour. They make all of their money from tips, which is crazy. It should be they just making minimum wage and they don't need to worry about tips, but they just don't do that. They need to change it, I think. So yeah, when you go to the US, you need to tip. It's not really mandatory. You really need to, or it's seen as very, very rude. Uh, in says, can I pay for tip by credit card? Yes. When um when you pay with a credit card, there will be a receipt, and it will say the subtotal, then it will say tip, then it will say total. So you write in your tip, then you write in the total, including tip, and then you pay. So they'll give you like the bill, and the bill would say, you know, write your tip here. 
Um, so yes, you can tip with a credit card. Uh, let's see. At restaurants and hotels, you can say, I have a reservation under Mr. Hollis or Miss Hollis. Uh, so yeah, you have a reservation under this name. That's what we say. If you have a reservation, you have a reservation under this name. When you go to a restaurant or a hotel. I'm going to go a little bit fast because we're running out of time. Uh, at restaurants, if you have a reservation or if you don't have a reservation, you can just say, I'd like a table for two. I'd like a table for two. I'd like a table for four. You know, this is how many people I have in my party. So we say a table for two or a table for four. And again, remember my tip from earlier, it's good to use gestures. Use your fingers so that there's no miscommunication. Uh, at restaurants, when you're finished eating, you can say, may I have the bill? You know, when you're, when you're done eating, you want to pay and leave, you can say, may I have the bill when you get a chance? When you get a chance means don't worry, don't hurry, just we'd like to get the bill soon. I'm going a little bit fast because we're running out of time. Also at restaurants, you can say, is the tip included in the service charge? You might have to ask sometimes. If you, if you see the bill and the bill says, you know, like 10% service charge, what is that service charge for? Is that, does that include the tip? I don't understand. So you can ask, is the tip included in the service charge? Some restaurants have service charges, some do not. If your restaurant has a service charge, you should ask if the tip is included. It's good to know. Because if it's not included, you need to leave a tip. If it is included, you don't need to leave a tip. At conference centers, if you're traveling for business, um, you know, people might ask you, what are you doing here? You say, I'm speaking at the English conference. I'm speaking at the business lecture conference. Um, you can use this as a question, even though it looks like a statement. So if you go to, if you go to the conference center where you're speaking, and you don't know where to go. The conference center is huge, and there's so many places to go, you don't know the direction. You can ask somebody, uh, I'm speaking at the business lecture, and they'll tell you, oh, it's over there. Oh, it's over there. They'll tell you, they understand. Even though it's a statement, it sounds like a question. I'm speaking at the uh, Cuffs English conference. They'll just, before you can even ask which way, they'll point you to the way. At the conference center, when you're speaking, you can say, can I get a mic check? You know, can, can you check my microphone? I need to make sure it's working. Or where can I plug in my USB for the PowerPoint? Um, yeah, so just some simple things when you're speaking at a conference. You need to make sure your microphone works. You need to make sure that your PowerPoint is working. Let me go a little bit fast here. Uh, okay. Now, we're going to look at five examples of things that might go wrong while traveling. We, we probably won't have time for all five things, but we're going to try to look at a few of them. So we're going to look at five examples of things that might go wrong while you're traveling. I want you to tell me in the live chat, what is your plan B? If this happens to you, what is your plan B? So the first is, you're at the airport, and Jenny will know this. The airline loses your luggage. You have nothing when you arrive at your destination. What is your plan B? What do you do? Write in the live chat. The airline loses your luggage. You have nothing when you arrive at your destination. What is your plan B?
I'm waiting for someone to type in the live chat. What is your plan B? If, you lo if the airline loses your luggage, you arrive and you have nothing to do. Wait, what's your plan B? <clears throat> Unju Shin says, sit and do nothing until the airline finds the luggage. What if they can't find it? What if they accidentally put it on the wrong plane and it's in a different country? I'll buy what I need and get back from my travel insurance. That's a good idea. In says, though, buy what they need and get back from their, what they need from their travel insurance. Also, keep in mind that airlines, they're not supposed to just lose your luggage. They need to pay you back. So you can actually file a complaint, and they should pay you for what you need to buy. So even if you don't have travel insurance, if you buy the necessities, like some just extra clothes or something, they're supposed to pay you back, the airline. Um, it's kind of difficult to make them do this. It is possible, though. And if they lose your luggage forever and they never find it, they definitely have to pay you for what was in your luggage. But the problem is you have to prove what was in your luggage. So if you had, like, an expensive camera in your luggage, you need a receipt for it. It's, it's a really big pain. But it is possible to get your money back. It's just very difficult. But, yeah, the best idea is what In said is to just buy what you need and get your travel insurance to pay you back later. Um, Jung Daun says, just can't, can't just wait until they find my luggage so I would leave my contact number. Yeah, there's, it could take, like, like for Jenny, it took two weeks. For me, it took a month to get my luggage back. Um, it can take a long time. Okay, let's look at the next one. You can keep typing, though. Sightseeing. You plan to spend the whole day at the beach, like me, in Guam. But it's raining. What is your plan B? What are you going to do? You can't go to the beach because it's raining. What is your plan B? Tong Dong says, I would go to the spa. That's a good idea. Go to the spa. Enjoy your day somehow. Spa is a nice way to enjoy the day. Uh, Andrew Shin says, go to an indoor swimming pool in the hotel if there is one. Oh, that's a good idea. Indoor swimming pool. Or Jenny says, find... Find nearby restaurants or cafes and sit inside and relax. That's a lovely idea, too. Have a cup of tea. Have a cup of coffee. Okay, we only have time for one more, but I really want to go and show one more. One more situation. This is a dangerous one. Uh, oh, In says, I'll go to the nearest Irish pub and drink some beer. That's where I would be. I'll see you there, In. Um, at a restaurant, you try to pay for your meal, but your credit card is declined. You don't have enough cash either. What's your plan B? What are you going to do if your credit card is declined, it doesn't work, and you don't have enough cash? What's your plan B? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? If you go have a nice meal on your vacation, you try to pay and, uh-oh, your credit card doesn't work and, uh-oh, you don't have enough cash. Sayak says, we have Samsung Pay. 
But does that work in other countries? I don't know. Does that work in like Europe or in the US? Uh, Jenny says, oh my God, I will leave my ID card as a guarantee. Go find an ATM, get cash, and come back. That's probably what you have to do, yeah. Benjushin says, borrow some money from people around you and promise them to pay them back? If you're with people, what if what if you're only with your like boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or husband and they don't their cards don't work either? Um, cacao pay? I don't think cacao pay works in other countries. Other countries don't have cacao. Um Tung Down says, if I was with friends, just ask them to pay instead. But if I was alone, I would go to an ATM. Uh, Mi Kyung says, I will explain my situation to them and leave my personal information like the hotel room number. That's a good idea. Hotel room number. Um, although it's a good idea to think about leaving your ID, I would not do that. I wouldn't leave my ID, especially my passport. Because my passport is so important when I'm traveling. I can't lose it, you know. I'm not leaving my passport with somebody, so I'd, I'd be scared to do that. I would, I would almost rather leave my phone or something, not my passport. Um, oh, In says, I'll ask if I can use PayPal or bank transfer. That's a good idea. PayPal's a good idea. Most people use PayPal. Um, yeah, I like, I like Meek Young's idea. Explain my situation, leave my personal information like the hotel room number, and hopefully, hopefully pay them back as soon as possible. Um, yeah, it's a difficult situation. There's no right or wrong answer well the wrong answer is dine and dash have you ever heard of this dine and dash don't do this so dine and dash means that you well dine which means you eat and then you dash which means you run so don't don't do dine and dash <laughs> not good it's illegal um okay that's all we have time for today Thank you for joining me again. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. I think we have one more class next week, and I think that's the end of our Saturday classes. Um, yeah, Tung Down says, now I really want to travel. Me too. Oh, I really want to travel. Go somewhere. That'd be fun. Uh, uh, Young Kim is saying, like, Mok Tui? I think that's, yeah, that might be Diamond Dash, maybe. I'm not sure what it would be in Korean. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time, and... Have a good day. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye.